Yeah, uh, welcome to uh, this talk uh, entitled Writing Elephants Safely. Um, it's basically about working with Postgres when your DBA is not around. Um, as you may know, the uh, mascot for Postgres is the elephant, so you want to work with your database without breaking it and taking your, taking your application down. So we'll just go about, we'll, we'll be talking about that today. So just real quick about myself. Um, I am a software developer uh, and I was a support engineer at Enterprise DB uh, since 2015. Um, we work with a lot of uh, large scale clients like insurance companies, uh, banks, military, governments. And um, yeah, I think I uh, just want to share from my experience uh, what a lot of our customers uh, had to deal with. So hopefully this will get you oriented with uh, Postgres, if, if you're not already in, uh, familiar with it. Um, these days, I'm actually using Postgres uh, behind uh, some apps that I'm writing in Golang and Python. And uh, before that, I was a web developer using Perl uh, before I uh, switched over to being a DBA. And I've been working with Postgres since 2002, and uh, just I really like using this database. It, uh, I was first a MySQL user, but then after working with Postgres, I, I couldn't go back. So um, yeah, this talk, is this for you? I think uh, you know, if you're a software developer or a QA engineer, a data scientist, someone who writes applications that uses a database, but you don't actually interact with the database itself on a regular basis, this talk is for you. Um, maybe if you're interested in being independent from someone else who manages the database, so if it's like a sysadmin or a DBA, um, someone who manages these environments and you're, you're actually not able to uh, you know, use them uh, hands-on on a regular basis, uh, this, this talk would be for you. Um, maybe your DBA is on vacation, uh, or maybe your DBA quit or got laid off, or if you've never had a DBA and you're just inheriting this database that you have to work with, uh, this talk is for you, okay? Um, yeah, so what are we gonna talk about? Uh, I, I can't do justice to Postgres in one hour because there's so many things to go over. So we're gonna limit ourselves to just a few of these topics so that way uh, at least you can get your feet wet, uh, you can get your, find your way around the database uh, maybe even the the, uh, the server itself. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll be talking about just for just a handful of these things, and I'm going to uh, detail them here. Okay. First, uh, we want to be able to log into the database, and maybe even start and stop it if we need to. Second, uh, we want to be able to take a backup before we run into some kind of catastrophic damage. Um, and then we also want to be able to diagnose some pretty common performance or stability issues by uh, reading through the logs and through some views within the database. And then uh, we want to be able to identify any uh, schema changes that might improve the performance of the database. And then uh, understand the uh, file and directory structure within uh, on the disk. Okay. And most of these commands, if not all, I, I didn't keep track of all of them, but most of the things that I'm going to share with you today can be done while the database is up and running. So you will not need to restart it. You will not need to have a downtime. We want to keep the database up and running because you are not the DBA. Someone else is. And you don't want to be responsible for taking the database down. Okay? So um, just to kind of... Uh, if the database is not running, we might need to start that up. So we'll, 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 we'll take that first step of getting the database started. Okay. Now, uh, for for the majority of users out there, you guys, uh, you all might be uh, able to SSH or use some kind of remote connection into uh, the server. Uh, if you are using a managed database like RDS, uh, you'll need to start and stop that from the console. Now. Assuming that you can actually SSH into the machine, um, most of them are using Linux, and we're at a Linux conference, so uh, SSH is probably the way to go. Um, you'll want to be able. You want to first uh, perform some sanity checks before starting it up. So if the database is down, you log in. You want to uh, check to see if the disk space is 
uh, if there's free disk space to be able to start the database because sometimes a uh, database will crash because it ran out of disk space. So you want to perform the DF minus H to see if any partitions are full and then address uh, those partitions uh, accordingly. And then you'll also want to look at your database logs. Uh, usually uh, syslog will help, uh, otherwise you might need to find the logs and I'll uh, try, to get you, try to help you with that uh, as we go on. Um, the database logs might have some messages that explain why the database isn't running. Like uh, it crashed, uh, something, something else happened, somebody shut it up down on accident. So uh, you want to know why it shut down before you try to start it back up. Okay. Now once you figure all that out and you, just, you determine that it's safe to start the database up, you want to use systemctl and start Postgres. Um, depending on the distribution, of Postgres or the distribution of the OS, you may need to use uh, a Postgres Dual Dash version to start it up. Um, brute force, if you don't want to use system TL, CTL or you can't, um, you can use PGCTL. And PGCTL is the, uh, is the command that is used by system TTL to start the database. So if you don't want to use it, you can just start it up manually yourself with PGCTL. Um, However, you'll need to know uh, where the PG data directory lives in order to start it up. Um, usually that's in, if you're using the community version of Postgres and you know, not, not a redistribution by another company, uh, it should be in var lib pgsql slash and then the version and then data. Um, and then again, if you're using uh, Ubuntu, it, it might be a little tricky to figure that out too. So, uh, you'll need to figure out where PG data is. That is the data directory where all the data lives. Um, if you don't know it, uh, try asking your sysadmin, ask your DBA, get that information beforehand before those people disappear. Okay? Um, yeah, so the, so PGCTL start will start the database. Now, if, if for some reason you need to stop it, um, there are three modes to stop. When you pass it with, with no uh, arguments, it'll go into a smart shutdown mode, which basically really cleanly shuts it down by waiting for all the, disconnect, all the sessions to disconnect, and then uh, it shuts down. However, uh, if, you, uh, if you use the mode fast, MF, uh, what that will do is that will, uh, oh man, Blinking out, sorry. Uh, I think that will uh, stop the, it'll wait for all the queries to disconnect, uh, all the queries to finish and then it'll, it'll stop. So one, the first one, it waits for all the sessions to disconnect. Second one, waits for all the queries to, to, to finish. MI is immediate, it actually simulates a crash of the database, it just shuts everything down. And then if you ever have to start it up again, it'll start in recovery mode, which takes a little bit extra time, okay? Now, uh, so now that the, uh, the database is up and running, uh, we want to be able to connect. So what you're going to need to be able to connect, you're going to need the host name, and you're going to need a port, which is usually 5432, but in some uh, instances it could be a different port number. So you'll need to use uh, maybe like netstat or something to figure out which uh, ports, uh, well, yeah, which port is listening to on. And then you'll need a username and password, uh, and then you also, uh, you, you might need to check the postgresql.conf file to figure out uh, if any of the if any of these don't uh, if the port number is, is not not standard and then if your listen addresses is not set to star. Okay. Um, connecting uh, tools that we use to connect uh, the the one that I'm going to use today is called PSQL. This is the default command line interface, and if uh, if you, if, if you use this, you, you basically can use, uh, just put in some queries just like any other, uh, like, like a bash interface sort of. You just type in the query, you pr press semicolon and press enter, and then uh, the, the queries run. Now if you need to use like a GUI, uh, we would recommend uh, PG Admin or dBeaver. These are some pretty popular uh, graphical u uh, user interface uh, that, that allows you to connect to the database and run some queries. Okay, so uh, so let's say I connect, right? So I connect with PSQL. I pass in my h, my host name, and then my username and my 
database name. And then uh, it just assumes that it's using 5432. So, uh, so you, don't, you don't need to pass it in a port if, you don't, if, if it's going to be the uh, standard port. Now, the, once I log in, I'm presented with a prompt with the database name. And I can do a bunch of these backslash commands to figure out, you know, kind of figure my way around. The first thing I can do is backslash L, which lists all the databases that have been created for this machine. Um, the one that I'm going to be using is going to be EDB admin. Uh, Postgres is a database that's created by default. Um, some people use that by default, but I highly don't recommend that uh, just, for, just for the sake of, uh, I guess, security. And then template zero and template one are databases that are provided by Postgres as, uh, as kind of like a bootstrap way to create other databases. So you don't want to you don't want to use those and you don't want to delete those either. Um, if you actually modify template one, uh, any other database that gets created will, will have whatever's in template one. So if you create a table in template one and you create a new database, that, that table is going to show up in that new database. So you don't want to touch these uh, unless you, actually you don't want to touch them at all. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, what else can I do in there? Okay, so I can do backslash D, which uh, describes all the, uh, all the tables and sequences that are visible to me, okay? Um, as you can see, if I do backslash C, I only see these two views. I don't see any tables. And the reason why is because uh, some of my tables actually don't exist in the public schema. By default, my, uh, my namespace is going to be public and my username, which is uh, going to be EDB admin. So if I wanted to, I can type DN, which describes the namespaces or schemas. And here we'll see I have a namesca namespace called my schema and then public and the results. So if I want to actually be able to see uh, those tables that are in those schemas, I'll need to change the search path. And I'll show you, uh, it's just search underscore path and you'll need to set that. Uh, on the on the prompt, okay. Um, so so now we've connected. We can kind of see what tables there are. Uh, what is going on in the database? So some usually when somebody logs in and wants to use the database, it's probably because uh, they need to figure out something, right? Figure out what's going on, right? And the way that you figure that out is by using this view called PG Stat Activity. And what this does is it shows what's going on in the database at that very instant. And if you're using RDS or uh, Google Cloud, that table might, or uh, the view might actually have limited uh, visibility. It's, it's basically because you're not a super user. So uh, if, you, if you can get super user access to be able to view everything, uh, that would be very helpful, okay? And, and then if you actually have access to uh, PSQL, then you can show log directory, and that'll show you where the logs are. And then that directory will, uh, will contain all the text, text logs of uh, various things that are, that are going on or happened in the database. Okay. And then RDS, will, uh, uh, cloud-based uh, distributions will, will have the logs available if, if your sysadmin uh, made it available to you. Okay. Um, okay. And once you've decided, uh, once you've figured out what's going on, and you might need to actually like stop a process or stop a query, uh, you can actually use these two commands: pg cancel backend and pg terminate backend. pg cancel backend will will uh, cancel a query, so the query that's running will get canceled, and then uh, that session stays open. However, if you uh, find that insufficient, like for some reason that's not, uh, you know, resolving the problem that you're, you're uh, experiencing, you may want to use PG terminate backend on, uh, on that process ID. Okay, so how do we get the process ID? Okay, so, so here's, I'll, I'll show you this, right? So here's a, here's a view of PG stat activity. As you can see, it's a little bit hard to read because it's really wide. It's got three lines full of column names and it could be a little tricky to read. So one tip, you can use uh, backslash X to turn it, 
transposed. So you can show all the columns as rows, and then uh, you, sh you see one record at a time. Okay, so now I do pgstat activity again, and then I can see this PID is running out of vacuum, and then this PID over here uh, is, actually that's me, that's my query, right? So like, let's say somebody, uh, you, you look at this view and you say, oh, this query's been running for a very long time, or it's, it's been idle and it's, it's actually holding a lock or something like that. Uh, you do pg cancel backend or pg terminate backend on this PID and then it'll um, do what it needs to do. So here's a quick example. Um, so let's say I get in here and I look for everything where uh, it's active or idle in transaction. And I see that this, this vacuum full is, uh, is active and it's waiting on something. It's waiting on a lock. So it's, it's running, but it, it's basically stuck and it can't go any further. And you look at the second row, you see that, oh, there's this other, there's this other query, this select query that um, is idle in transaction. And okay, so something, something's a little fishy, right? So what you can do is you can take this view and this information from PG stack activity and cross reference it with PG locks, right? And you look at which locks are not granted. And here we go, this one is not granted. And you wanna find the relation uh, or the table that has the same ID and find where it is granted. And it turns out, uh, in this particular example, I actually have another session somewhere that actually did a begin and it locked the table in exclusive mode and then it does a select. And the moment you do the select, the, the table's locked and then uh, that's why it shows up in this view that uh, this, query, this query ran, right? But it's now it's waiting, waiting on the client, so it's actually not an active query anymore. Okay, so that's, that's just a, it's just idle in transaction. So I started the transaction and I ran a query and then I walked away for lunch and then now it's blocking the vacuum or blocking whatever else, um, you know, whoever else is using the database, right? So you wanna be, definitely look for uh, idle transactions, cross reference it with PG locks and then that'll help you um, figure out uh, what needs to be done. And then, so I, because this is not a query, it's, it's just sitting there, then I have to use PG terminate backend. So I do PG terminate backend on this PID, and then that session ends, and then my vacuum can continue. Okay. All right. So, all right. So that's that's a very important part of working with the database um, in terms of making sure the app keeps up up and running. Now let's talk about configuration for a little bit. Okay, um, configuration is all contained within the PostgreSQL.conf file, and that is within PG Data. So that's why you need to know where that PG Data folder is. Um, for some, for I think for Debian, it's actually in uh, slash et etc. So yeah, depending on the uh, distribution of Linux you're using, you may need to look outside of PG Data. Okay. There's also a file called PostgreSQLAuto.conf. And that is actually something that uh, humans should not be working with because the alter system command will edit that file for us, okay? So if you're in PSQL and you want to change your configuration, uh, you can do alter system set, you know, whatever configurable to whatever value you want. Um, that's a, a very convenient way to, to to change the configuration. However, uh, I think it's limited to certain uh, users. So if you, if you actually have file access to the PostgreSQL.com file, it's probably better, right? Now, um, what, what is the current state of configuration? Now, sometimes some people will edit the PostgreSQL.com file and then forget to reload it or forget to restart the database. So what's actually loaded in Postgres is not matching with what's in PostgreSQL.conf. And in that situation, uh, it can cause a lot of confusion. So what you wanna do is you wanna get into PSQL and run show all, and it'll just print the whole table. This is the current configuration that's loaded. These are the current values, okay? And, okay, 
So the configuration, um, you can change some of it without having to restart the system, so without a, without a downtime. And I'm going to go over a few of those with you. But just to get a list of what those, what those uh, like parameters are, you can actually run this query. Select name setting from PG settings where context is in sig hub or user. So if you, this, this will provide a list of all the things that you, you yourself can change without actually causing, without af actually requiring a downtime. Okay? And all you have to do, uh, if in the user context, um, you can say just set parameter to value and then, and then it'll, it'll go. So like, I guess the, the, easiest, um, the easiest example would be work mem. So work mem is set globally uh, in your comp file, but it can be edited uh, at, a, at a user level because you want actual work memory to do sorting or joins on a, on a query that, that is particular to you, your use case. So you would say set work mem to you know, 100 megabytes or whatever, right? And if you want to actually uh, set it globally, then you say alter system set work mem to and then the value. And then you do a, uh, a sig hub on the postmaster process or you do a, um, a PG reload comp, okay? All right. Um, yeah, or the, uh, the other options is actually find the, find the PID pertaining to Postmaster and then just do a kill hub. Okay, so some of the useful configuration parameters, I, I talked about work mem. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go over a few of them with you. Um, some people will wonder why I don't talk about shared buffers and max connection. These are the two most important parameters uh, in your database, but they might not be useful to you if you're not a DBA because Changing these require a downtime. You don't want to have a downtime, so we're not going to we're not going to go to those in depth. Now, search path. So, like I mentioned, uh, the namespaces. Like, if you by default, search path is, is public, and your username. Um, if you want to add to it, you say set search path to, and then a comma, del comma delimited list of all the namespaces you want to be able to look in. You can change that in the uh, PostgreSQL.conf, and then reload the database, and then uh, you'll have like a larger set of uh, namespaces that you can look at by default. Uh, work mem, like I mentioned earlier, is just memory allocated to sorting and hashing. Um, you want to be careful with this. If you change it in postgresql.com, it could affect other users. Like let's say you, you have a, you know, a machine with 64 gigabits of RAM, gigabytes of RAM, and then you say work mem equals one gigabyte. Uh, every session gets one gigabyte. So if you have 100 sessions using, uh, using the database, you're going you're gonna, to uh, run into memory issues and you might have a crash. So set the work mem low or, or just kind of the like average. And then on a, on a per session basis, you set the work mem manually to whatever you need for your queries. Okay. Um, maintenance work mem is also uh, very, uh, it could be potentially useful if you're trying to deal with a performance issue. Um, maintenance work, work mem is similar. It just sets um, sets uh, sorry uh, sets a uh, um, memory for for your vacuum to be able to work with it. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm good. Yeah, it's okay. I'm sorry. Oh, I, uh, I think it's underneath the podium. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks. And then um, some other parameters that you can change without having to change the uh, restart the database are some of the log parameters. So this gives you more visibility into uh, what gets printed into the logs. Okay. Now, um, let's see. So these ones, I'm not going to go into them too much, but uh, log line prefix gives you more. Uh, uh, more information about the, the session that caused that log entry. And the log, log checkpoints uh, might show you whether you're checkpointing too much or uh, and causing uh, IO, IO issues. And then log connections, log disconnections uh, will tell you whether, uh, when a session started and when a session ended. 
So that's useful if you need to do some auditing. And then auto vacuum iteration and hostname, these are also uh, pretty useful depending on your, uh, on your use case. I have a separate talk on this, so I won't go into this too much. But um, yeah, these are, these are some pretty, uh, pretty useful in terms of you as a, as a developer or DBA trying to figure out what, what is causing you know, like performance issues with your application. Okay? Now, uh, one thing to, to note is that these logs are not wall logs. Okay? I think uh, some people might get a little confused with that. So I'm going to go into that uh, real quick. So wall logs, what are wall logs? Wall stands for write ahead log. Okay? And what this is is a journaling system. Every modification to a database table is written to the wall log. And at checkpoint time, it gets permanently flushed to the disk. So um, these wall files, they live in PG data slash PG wall. Now, if you somehow see the word PG X log, which is what PG wall used to be called, you may want to do yourself a favor and talk to your sysadmin and try to get your database upgraded because ever since 9.6, uh, we're at 16 now, so yeah, PGX log is definitely very old. Okay, but yeah, uh, Wall is a journal, and it basically provides a means of dis disaster recovery. So at a checkpoint, all the Wall files information gets flushed to the disk into uh, PG data slash base. Okay, and then it, from that point, there's a there's a kind of a not a transaction ID, but some kind of ID that, that tells you when the last check, checkpoint was. And then all the new uh, information gets written uh, to the wall. And then if you crash, you basically say, oh, I know that what's in base is matches where the checkpoint is. So I can start with the checkpoint and replay everything. And then you basically recover up to the last, uh, last write before the database crashed. Okay. So you can see why this is a very, very important um, folder. Now, um, needless to say, do not delete these files. <laughs> um, I say this because our customers have done it before, right? And those customers will remain nameless. But yeah, I think uh, people do get confused. Oh, it's a, it's a log file, so I don't, I don't need it. But no, it's actually a disaster recovery log file. So you don't want to um, touch any of those files in there. Now, if you actually go to your PG data folder, you know, here is varlib postgresql 15 main. This is, a, uh, this is a Ubuntu machine. Okay, you'll see that there's a bunch of, uh, you know, stuff here. There's the base folder, which is where all the data actually lives, and then a bunch of other stuff, and then there's the PG wall folder. Okay, so you don't want to touch that file, uh, touch that folder. If you actually go into it, you'll see these uh, files which, which are very, uh, very neatly named with a bunch of zeros. Those are the wall files themselves. Okay? So each wall segment is about 16 uh, megabytes by default. Um, if you compile differently, you might get a different size, but 16 is the, is the standard size. So this is what it looks like. So I'm showing this to you now so that when you ever see it, you know, oh, I better get out of this directory. Okay? <laughs> All right. Okay, <laughs> so um, so we talked about uh, configuration logs, wall logs. Um, I'm going to move on to authentication. This is a really um, really short topic, but I think uh, it's, it's important for you to know. So uh, authentication information is stored in pghba.com, host-based access control. So HBA. Now this actually allows you to control in a very um, you know, you can slice and dice who gets, who gets access and uh, what hosts get access, what database they get access to, how they authenticate, um, and things like that, whether, whether or not they use SSL. So this is, um, okay, so any changes to it can just be committed with a HUP or a reload, okay? So, Here's an example of what a PGHB comp might look like. This is the default, so um, a real one wouldn't have password. I think you would use 
some other authentication method. But um, so like for example, right, if I say uh, this, this address is, so basically it's, it's read top down, okay, and then the first match is the first match where your connection fully matches all the parameters uh, is the one that it's going to be using to connect to the database. Okay, so like for example, my I I, I type PSQL and I um, PSQL to my local host. Okay, now all users and all databases are accessible by this one as long as a password is is validated. Okay, so. I, I connect with my laptop to, you know, the Postgres that's running on my laptop, and it'll say, it's a, it's a host, it's not a Unix socket, and then it's, it, it, he wants to connect to a database that, that is on my system, and any, of, any user from this one can connect, and then, and then it says okay, and then it will actually send my connection to, uh, to it, it'll fetch the, the password information out of the database and compare my password with it. And then if that works, then I can actually log into PSQL and start running queries, okay? So you can actually, uh, connect, you can actually limit this by like subnets. Uh, certain subnets can connect to the database. Uh, only certain users can connect to the database. Um, only certain databases by a particular user, um, things like that, okay? So, uh, I won't, I won't go into too many more uh, examples here, but this is a this is a way for you to uh, control who gets to who gets to even try to connect to the database. Okay. All right. Um, vacuuming. Okay. So I think a lot of our customers that came to us um, they came to us with performance issues, and they're wondering why is why is our database not performing well and a lot of times it turns out to be a, they're trying to run a bunch of queries while a vacuum is running, right? Now, um, what vacuuming is, is that it, it helps uh, prevent bloat. So um, if you're, if you're, if you're, uh, well, let me continue on. <laughs> so basically, an update or a delete on a table on a table doesn't actually delete or update that particular row that you're trying to edit. It actually um, flags a row as deleted, and then in an update, it inserts another row. So in that situation, you can actually have a lot of these deleted or dead rows, and then a lot of new rows, and then you're just gonna you're just gonna take up more space on disk, and you're gonna get uh, bloat. And what that, what, what, um, the problem there is that if you need to do like a sequential scan on a table, you're gonna um, have to scan even past those dead tuples as well, right? So that's why it'll slow down your database. So what Postgres offers is this thing called vacuum, and it basically goes through and flags those deleted rows as reusable for future inserts and updates so that, um, instead of continuing to tack on more rows at the end of a file, it finds a, a, a reusable dead row and inserts there. And if you vacuum enough, you can actually uh, keep your file size to a minimum and just keep reusing rows that are, that are flagged as deleted, okay? And the nice thing is that uh, we also offer, uh, there's also a feature called auto vacuum, which will uh, periodically uh, wake up, vacuum the table, uh, vacuum the database, and then um, you, you don't have to manually do that yourself. So you always have uh, uh, dead rows that are flagged as reusable, okay? Now, uh, but the problem is a lot of times uh, the customers, they run in, I mean, we're, we're, we're dealing with like banks and, uh, and large organizations and their tables are really, really, really big. And the vacuum takes a very long time. And in, that's, in those situations, you do see that uh, they're doing maybe like an ETL query, they're trying to aggregate some data, and then, 
it's happening at the same time as a vacuum, and it just creates this, just creates a situation where the the server actually just gets very slow, overloaded with I/O, and Usually, I, I recommend just waiting for those vacuums to finish, but in some, uh, some situations, uh, we do kill it, and then we you know, do some stuff to prevent the vacuum from waking up, and then allow their ETL to finish, and then go back and vacuum. Or, um, in some situations, you might discover that the auto vacuum, vacuum cost delay is set too high. And Sometimes you can just set it to zero, and then it'll make the vacuum finish faster, and then you can set it back to what it was before. Okay. So uh, I guess as a, as a non-DBA, you, you, if you're running into some kind of performance issue involving a vacuum, you want to du double check to make sure out of vacuum, vacuum cost delay is set lower, and, or the vacuum cost delay is set lower. Excuse me? Oh yeah. Okay. So the question was, um, if if a delete flags it as deleted, why does it automatically f flag it as reusable? And the reason for that is because of multi-version concurrency control, so MPCC. Um, other sessions might still be able to see that row that you deleted. So in order to handle multiple users, um, there needs to be a mechanism to be able to uh, flag it as deleted and those older sessions that are, you know, from a different transaction can still see those rows. So you have to wait for the, all that to finish, and then the vacuum uh, process comes through and, and marks it as reusable. Okay? Um, okay, so, yeah, yeah, so sometimes we kill those vacuums off to be able to uh, let other traffic go through. Uh, but that, that's just a, like a band-aid over the situation. It's, it's a, it's a stopgap. It's not the actual uh, solution. You have to wait for the vacuum to finish. So uh, one way to make it finish faster is by changing the cost delays. Okay? All right. Um, okay. All right. I have about 30 minutes. Okay. Um, so, so we talked about uh, vacuum maintenance, and we also talked about... Uh, Configuration, things like that. We want to be able to take backups, right? If you're, a, if you're, uh, have you have this database and um, you know you don't know you don't know what the condition is, you want to be able to take backup to be able to restore it. So Postgres, uh, the way that we use do backups is using this uh, program called PG Dump, and what it does is it does a plain text dump of the database. So when you PG Dump your database. What you end up with is just this text file with a bunch of inserts, create tables, uh, whatnot, to create the database. Okay, it's, it's completely human readable. Um, you can, you can uh, pass in some arguments to pgdump to limit you know, which tables or which namespaces uh, get dumped. And then you can actually uh, dump a compressed or binary version if you want to save space. And that actually uh, has an added benefit of allowing you to multi-thread or multi-process a restore. So it's actually, uh, if, you, if you can afford to use the binary version, it's, it's actually preferable. Um, the nice thing about pgdump is that it's less likely to copy corruption. Now I'm gonna get, that, I'm gonna get into that, uh, actually I'll get into that right now, okay. So there's three types of corruption, okay. Um, there's the, there's the corruption that happens on disk. So like, let's say, you know, there's a, there's a faulty driver or the head's like got some problems, the data on the disk gets corrupted, okay? Um, there's also corruption that's caused by um, stray DML commands. So like, you know, like maybe a coworker deleted, uh, deleted the entire table without, uh, without a, uh, or, or did an update without a where clause, right? Or um, or didn't use a, didn't use the transaction, right? So those those corruptions are caused by um, by I guess either humans or bad programs. And then the third type of corruption is uh, corruption by a PostgreSQL bug, which in most uh, most users' cases that that's not going to happen. I think uh, it's a very uh, 
it's very rare to hit a PostgreSQL bug, uh, just just using it on our on our laptops or within like a development environment. Okay, so the PG dump because it because it prints out human readable SQL, the the disk corruption or the uh, PostgreSQL bug corruption doesn't doesn't get uh, pulled into that file. Okay, but it's definitely slower because you're, you're converting binary data into text, okay? So if you want to take a faster backup, you can use something called PG base backup. And what this does is it takes the entire PG data directory and copies it. And that basically includes um, all the uh, indexes, all the constraints. It will include all the dead tuples, just everything that's in there. And Sometimes you might want that because uh, it's, it's faster, right? But um, you, the risk that you run is that you copy the corruption along with it if it, if it is already corrupted, okay? Um, so my, my usual recommendation is to have a little bit of both, right? We want to be able to have uh, a plain text dump, and then we also uh, want to be able to dump quickly, like every night you want to do a PG-based backup just in case uh, you need to restore right away, okay? Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's, oh yeah, the last thing I was gonna say, you gotta test those backups. They're, they're, <laughs> they're, we, we've actually run into situations where people uh, dump their database, they don't test it, and they discover, oh, the dump was empty because they dumped the wrong database or they, there was a typo or something like that. So yeah, test your, test your ba backups, make sure that uh, it works. Okay, question? Mm, okay, good question. So, um, okay, PG, base ba PG dump will not copy wall logs, but PG base backup will, okay? Uh, when you do the PG base backup, you it will copy everything in that PG data folder, but um, it only copies the wall logs up to up to that that moment, right? So if you if you want to be able to restore uh, from a later point in time, you're going to want to harvest those wall logs as well, right? So uh, we do ha there are other mechanisms that I won't be able to get into in this talk, but there are, there are ways to like constantly pull those wall logs so that way they're always ready, ready for you to use in the future, okay? All right, that's a good question, yeah. All right, um, just, you guys feel like you're drinking from a fire hydrant? <laughs> a lot of stuff. Um, I'm gonna talk about monitoring real quick, so, uh, I guess this, this is kind of extension of the logging that I was talking about earlier. And again, I have a logging talk on this, uh, so I won't be able to go too into detail. But um, if, you, if you set log line prefix, um, the, by default, I think it was just the timestamp and the process ID, which isn't really useful if you need to do a lot of like correlation between web apps or, or applications and users and stuff like that. So by using this, um, every single line will have a timestamp, process ID, uh, I think, I forget what this was, transaction ID, username, database name, application name, and then uh, host IP address or, or host name, right? So this, having extra stuff in your log line prefix allows you to uh, find more clues to uh, what's, what might be causing some kind of problem or what might have caused a problem in the past, okay? Um, and then the other one is log min duration statement. So any qu query that takes more than this parameter, so this is a millisecond, so and like you set it to 1,000, so any query that takes more than one second will get printed to the log. So you'll know what query it was uh, that, that took a long time. So like let's say you have a, a query that takes, you know, your, your database every night you know, if, if it gets really slow for about an hour and you're wondering why and you, 
you log min duration statement, you see, oh, this query that, that ran at 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. was, it took, a, it took a whole hour. And then, and then you know what query that was, and you can deal with it uh, accordingly. Okay? Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So other locking parameters. Um, so log statement will print, uh, print the query before it starts to execute. So this is different from log min duration statement. Log min duration statement prints the statement and its runtime after it's done. Log statement runs the query, uh, prints the query before it runs. Now, the reason why this might be useful is that if your database crashes, it never finished. So if you have log statement set to print the statement and then it crashes, you'll know which statement actually caused the crash. Right? So this might be useful in some situations. Log min error statement, um, if, let's say you have a app and the person wrote a query and it has some kind of syntax error, and you're wondering, oh, why, you know, why is this app not working? And you discover after, you know, log min error statement, that the, it will print, oh, syntax error, and then it'll print the query that, that had the syntax error. Then you'll actually be able to go back to the developer or, and, and you know, determine, oh, this is, this is the query that was a problem. You might need to fix that query. Right? So this is, you can set different levels, warning, error, fatal, or panic. Um, can't go into that too much here, but uh, it's just the severity of the, of the error. So if it, if it was an error, like a syntax error, it would just be this. Uh, if it was like uh, a query that, um, you know, that, that, that caused a, a crash, then, then it'll, if you set it to panic, only queries that cause the database to crash will, um, will, will get printed. But if you do warning, then it'll be more verbose. Like all the queries that have both crash and syntax errors, then uh, they will get printed. Um, log duration will only log the duration, which isn't that useful. I would recommend using uh, pgstat statements if, you, if you're trying to figure out you know, just averages of how long a query takes. Uh, log connections, uh, it, will, it will show you when the session begins, so that way you can kind of track, oh, this, this is what this user did when they, when they logged in, okay? All right, um, okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about performance. So explain and explain analyze. Explain um, is a, uh, if you're, if you're familiar with uh, Oracle, uh, you, might, you might have used explain before. It basically tells, tells you uh, this query will use this particular query plan. Okay, and then explain analyze will actually run the query and show you all the statistics behind uh, some, of the, uh, some of the joins or sorting or how long things took. Okay, now uh, there's also this thing called auto explain uh, as a developer, this is actually very useful. So if you can get AutoExplain installed onto your database, um, this is very useful because, especially if you're using an ORM, because ORMs, um, you, you, you specify a lot of objects and how they interact with each other, and then you write to database. You don't know what kind of query gets generated. And in, subs in, uh, in, in at least a couple instances uh, with, with some of our customers, I, um, we, 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 we had this query and we're like, this query runs fine. We run it by hand, it runs fine. Um, but then once we run it through the ORM, it doesn't run fine because the ORM is actually casting uh, certain, certain data types the wrong way, right? So this auto explain will kind of help you, will help you definitely uh, uncover those kind of issues. Okay, so just real quick about the difference between explain and explain analyze. So you can see that um, this, uh, this is PG Bench, which is a uh, benchmarking tool that comes built into Postgres. So I, I initialized it, and then I'm, I'm running this query, select star from PG Bench, uh, accounts join uh, branches where AID is less than 100,000. And you can see that, oh, it's gonna do two sequential scans, and then it's going to do a nested loop to join them together and then re return all the data. Now, you can notice that these costs, it's all that you get. And these costs are basically the estimates that, 
the query planner is using to make the decisions on what kind of scan, what kind of loop, or what kind of join it's going to take. But once you do explain analyze on the same query, you're going to get this additional stuff, which shows you the time it took for each leg, and then the actual time at the end. Okay. So this is actually very useful in terms of finding the bottleneck uh, of, of a particular query. So usually your query might will be a lot more complex than this, and you'll get a lot more uh, rows in this uh, in this output. And you're gonna you're gonna find oh this is the part that took the most time, and maybe I need like an index on that. So here's. Uh, so make sure you use the right data types. Uh, Postgres uh, supports a lot of different data types, and using the right one will help you uh, ensure uh, that the query planner is making them the best decisions for you. Okay, so don't use all text. I think I've seen some people do that. Um, there's also you might get confused with JSON B and JSON. These are both JSON types for Postgres. Uh, JSON is just a text representation. It's just basically relabeled a text data type that just got relabeled as JSON. So if you want to use JSON, use JSON B. That actually allows uh, some additional features in terms of uh, indexing and searching. You can actually do a lot more. Uh, there, there are some JSON B operators that make uh, make working with JSON a lot faster. Okay. And it's also very important to have the proper indexes on your tables, so that way you can actually uh, do the scans a lot faster. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, will, it will not what? Right. Yeah, it's a dry run. It doesn't actually. Uh, it doesn't actually run the query itself. So if you do, explain, delete something, it won't actually delete. But if you do explain, analyze, delete, it will actually delete, so be careful. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so just an example here. Uh, so I do explain, analyze on this, this query, and I see, oh, it's, this sequential scan took 45 uh, milliseconds. Now I took a, um, crea I created an index on this column, right, and I run it again, it's a lot faster. Right, because now it now what is it's doing is that instead of searching the entire table for anything where BID equals one, it just scans through the index, which is just basically just for this for the purposes of, of explanation. It's just uh, all the values and then uh, like the, the the locations on disk. Right. So if I find all the all the values in the in, in my index where BID equals one. I know exactly where to grab it from the disk, and it's a lot faster. Okay. All right. Um, my last slide here. So, what not to do? Okay. What not to do? Don't delete anything. But also, don't kill nine on any Postgres process. Okay. The even the PSQL process, I, I would highly recommend it against it. Okay. Um, killing kill nine on a Postgres process actually simulates. It causes the entire thing to crash. And then it goes into recovery mode. And then um, once you start it up, it starts up in recovery mode, does a bunch of scans, and then it takes a long time before it's available again. So you'll have a downtime. So don't kill nine. Okay. Um, idle transactions. Uh, as a in 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 as a practice, always commit and roll back transactions. Don't leave them open because of that uh, that example I showed you earlier. Somebody locks it and then walks away and then um, the database is unusable, right? It'll hold up people. And then um, you look in PGStat activity, uh, look for uh, idle transactions. Don't, don't look for idle. Idle is just, it just is normal. If, if it's not running a query, it's idle. But if it's idle in transaction, that's bad, okay? And you want to cross-reference that with PG locks to figure out uh, which queries are being held up. Um, don't drop anything. Don't delete anything. Um, don't don't don't. You don't want to lose it and not be able to get it back, right? So rename things instead. Okay. Um, indexes. I, I think you can't just disable them, but uh, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to drop anything. Just rename things. Okay. And then um, don't delete stuff from PG data. 
especially PG wall, okay? And then uh, if, you, if you're curious what commands there are available in PSQL, uh, the, there's a, a backslash H and a backslash question mark, and that might be helpful to you, okay? And finally, um, where to find help? So there are a lot of different places where you can get help. Uh, if you if you don't have a lot of uh, DBA experience, uh, you can use. We have a Slack, we have a mailing list, which is a bit slower to get answers because it's mailing list. Uh, there's IRC, there's wikis, docs. The docs are really really good. I I did I learned most of uh, my DBA experience through uh, through the documentation actually. So uh, use the docs; they're really good. And then. Uh, Obligatory plug for EDB support. Uh, you know, my company uh, we we offer support for customers, uh, different tiers. So if you want, uh, you can get support with us. Uh, all these links up here are available on the link tree. So link tree, Postgres help. So you can you can use those as a resource. Okay. All right. So that's it in terms of uh, what I wanted to share with you. I hope that you found it very useful, and uh, just want to wish you a happy Pi Day. Right. Any uh, can you go over wall logs again? So is it just recovery of logs or is it recovery of the database? Um, sorry, recovery? Uh, of the database, wall logs. Does it just recover the logs within the database, or is it recovering the database itself? So I think the question is um, wall logs and recovery. So, um, so when you do a PG-based backup, you get a snapshot of of that of that directory. Now, this this could be before or after a, a checkpoint, right? Actually, I think PG Base Backup issues a checkpoint for you. So you get it, you get a, it issues a checkpoint and you grab all the files. And then as it's, as it's grabbing the files, you could have produced more wall files, right? So at the end of the PG Base Backup, you get this snapshot from the moment you press enter. And what you're gonna want is all the wall files after you press enter. And then if you, uh, if you actually take those two things, so the PG base backup and all the wall files, you take it to another machine, you, you unzip or untar that, that folder, and that's there, and then you copy the wall files into the PG wall. When you start it up, it'll, it'll find, um, it'll start up saying, oh, I, I, here, was, here was the last checkpoint, and then it'll find all the wall files that, uh, that got created, or it'll, it'll just look for all those, it'll, it'll just notice those wall files in, in that folder. Say, hey, oh, there's wall files here. Let's, let's replay them, okay? And then it'll play it all the way to the end. And then at that point, you can log into the database and then you know, do whatever you need to do in there, okay? So that's, um, it's called point in time recovery. So if you wanna look up um, the documentation on that, uh, look for PITR or point in time recovery, and then uh, you'll get, you get, definitely get a lot more uh, examples, uh, use cases for that. Okay. Um, so you said there was two different backup commands and you said the first one was text space. So like, um, what does that look like? Or like, is it like, like this uh, representation entire database in like block by block, I mean, page by page, or? No, it's, it's text commands. So uh, if so you actually do a PG dump on a database, what you end up with is, um, well, what it'll be is a bunch of set commands to set the like, kind of like environment variables, and then it'll say create table, whatever, uh, insert this row into the database, so in, 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 insert into table, stuff like that. So like so it recreates all the queries. To yeah, all the queries, okay. yeah. Um, so 
I have a question regarding like restore. So if you have to restore, do you have to load the schema first before you restore the dump, or the dump will take care of the schema of the database? Oh, that's a good question. OK, so a PG dump will dump both the D DDL, which is all the, all the um, table creation, stuff like that. And then it'll, it'll also have the DML together. If you want, some people do PG dump and say uh, uh, schema only. And then it'll do only the DDL. And then you do PG dump data only, and you'll have a separate file. So, but if you do it all in one and you just pass it into an empty database, it'll, it'll create the tables for you. Right? But if you, if you want to separate it, you can actually create the tables first and then, uh, and then load the data in later. So you, you have options there. I'm sorry? Does it also preserve the user data, like the passwords and user credentials? Oh, OK. So that, those, those are outside of, so when you do PG dump, you usually pass a database name into it, so you dump only that database. If you want to dump the uh, user information as well, you do PG dump all. OK, so there's a PG underscore dump all, and then that will dump everything, uh, all databases. And if you only want the global information, I think, I forget if it was a, there was another flag that you pass in that dumps only the user information. Um, my memory fails me about how the passwords get dumped. But uh, yeah, user information will get, will get dumped too. Okay. Thank you, All right, thank you very much.